and we are going to move on now into the specific garments of the high priest. And uh, we're not going to hit everything, but we're going to hit a bunch of them just a little bit. We're going to start with uh, the mitre, which is like the, a turban that the high priest wore. <clears throat> and that's in Exodus 28 and verse uh, 36. <clears throat> And thou shalt make a plate of pure gold and engrave upon it like the engravings of a signet, holiness to the Lord. And thou shalt put it on a blue lace that it may be upon the mitre, upon the forefront of the mitre it shall be. And it shall be upon Aaron's forehead that Aaron may bear the iniquity of the holy things which the children of Israel shall hallow in all their holy gifts, and it shall be always upon his forehead that they may be accepted before the Lord. <clears throat> all right, so one of, the, one of the identifying factors of this mitre or this turban or this, uh, uh, some call it a holy crown or whatever, is that it has this inscription upon it, holiness to the Lord. And... Remember now, all of these garments are for glory and for beauty. So holiness to the Lord just simply shows that the high priest is holy and completely devoted to the task of glory and beauty to the Lord. And, and of course, you know, holiness, we always have to define this every time I say it because there's been so much teaching. The average... Um, teaching on holiness is holiness represents not sinning. That's what most people teach. But, ex but I'm saying that's generally not the meaning, but particularly not the meaning when it comes to uh, the things of the tabernacle. Because all of the things of the tabernacle were made holy. And all that meant was they weren't made sinless but they were separated unto the Lord and separated unto the Lord's use. And that's what made them holy. holy. The word holy and the word sanctify come from the basic same root word. So when it tells you to sanctify, it doesn't mean uh, to get a strainer and put everything of you in it and then strain out all the evil. There, now you're sanctified. Good luck getting rid of everything, you know. If that's the case, no one is sanctified, right? But rather, it means to separate yourself unto the Lord. And that everything in the tabernacle, if it was made holy, was simply this. They took a, a let me just say it like this. They took a common cup and they said, this cup is going to be one of the holy vessels of the tabernacle. So we're going to sanctify it and we're going to make it holy. And all that meant was, we're not going to use it out here for putting the dog food in his, in his uh, pail anymore. Or, you know, stuff like that. We're going to use this only for the Lord. Okay, the emphasis of that isn't that you're no longer using it for sin. The emphasis of that is that from now on, this is separated unto the Lord for his use, okay? So, you know, I mean, anybody familiar with, I mean, years and years and years ago, there was a movement called the Holiness Movement. <clears throat> and the Holiness Movement was basically this. Man, if you were part of the Holiness Movement, you weren't gonna sin, everybody, I mean, they just, they were like on a witch hunt for anybody that sinned and stuff, which, you know, everybody does. So, I mean, it was, I'm sure, a lot of fun. And, <clears throat> <clears throat> And you don't, you don't hear a lot about the holiness movement anymore because they ripped one another to shreds. Does that make sense? I mean, wouldn't, wouldn't you? But a true holiness movement, a true holiness movement would be a movement towards the tabernacle or being the body of Christ and everything just being separated to go after the Lord. Now, I've always given this example, but... You know, if, the, if, if you were standing over here in all of your mess and all of your junk and the Lord was over here and the Lord said, come unto me, as you came, you'd be leaving all of you and all of your junk and you'd be coming to the Lord. 
the way to become holy is not by standing there and fighting and trying to throw away all the bad stuff, but it's by coming to the Lord. It's not by fighting your darkness, but turning on the light, and the light chases away darkness. It's by getting closer to the Lord. It's by seeking the Lord. It's by putting the Lord first. And I will tell you that when you do that, a lot of the trouble that you used to have in certain areas, and there are areas, let me tell you something right now, there are areas that you used to have a hard time with that you don't even think about now. You're with the Lord. There are areas that are that way. You know why? Because you are separated under the Lord, and you are yet being separated under the Lord more and more. And I'm telling you, there's stuff that's messing with you right now that five years from now or ten years from now, you won't even remember that it was messing with you. I mean, it will be so not you that you won't remember it. And then somebody in a conversation will bring up and say, oh, I'm really having a hard time. And you go, oh, my God, I didn't even know I was over that. You know, you go, praise God, there is a God, you know. Well, what is the key to that? The reason why you don't remember it is because you were not fighting it anymore. You probably got tired and gave up. You started pursuing the Lord, and as you got to the Lord, as you were coming to the Lord, as you were being separated into the Lord, you're being separated from other things. Am I right? Now, of course, that, you know, that gets into the uh, whole aspect of, let me, let me give you a couple of scriptures, and uh, there's going to be a reason behind these scriptures, but I won't tell you the reason until the end, but I think it's a real important thing. In Exodus uh, 17, gosh, you know what? I don't think I wrote down... Maybe I did, let's say, no, of course not. Mm -mm -mm. All right, let's go to Isaiah 6. I remember that one for sure. Isaiah ch chapter 6. And we will read, we'll start one, we'll just go one through three. In the year that King Uzziah died, I also saw the Lord sitting upon a throne, high and lifted up, and his train filled the temple. Above it stood the seraphim, each one had six wings. With two he covered his face, and with two he covered his feet, and with two he did fly. And one cried unto another, and said, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. Now, the scripture I couldn't remember in Exodus is the one where they began to establish the Ark of the Covenant. You remember the Ark of the Covenant? And on the Ark of the Covenant, they put two golden cherubim that faced each other, and they looked over the presence of God. Well, this, folks, I don't know what we see in this. We, you know, we see the temple a lot of times, we, here it says, we saw the Lord, high and lifted up, sitting on a throne in the temple. So here's what we picture. We picture a throne of a king and a temple of a, of a court of the Lord instead of seeing the temple or tabernacle of the Lord. And that throne, folks, is nothing more than the mercy seat. That's the one Jesus sat down on. Jesus didn't sit down on some big gold throne. I don't know if you've ever seen, there's a, there's a television show that Christians put on, and it's a regular thing. They've got their own channel and stuff. And if you happen to catch the, the mother thing, they have a studio set up where people come and sit, and then people sit in these chairs and talk. If you look at the chairs, they're big old gold things like a, like a king would sit in. And I'm sure, you know what, I, I'm, I could be wrong about this, but I bet you anything I'm not. I'm sure that they had those things made specifically for them, and they said, we are king's kids, so we should be sitting on thrones. Well, first of all, you're not a king's kid, and neither are they. The king is Jesus, and you're not Jesus' kid. Am I right or wrong? I hear that all the time. We're king's kids. You ain't Jesus' kids. You're the father's kids. He's your brother. You are not king's kids. So on the premise of we're king's kids, we're going to make big thrones. And, of course, the thrones that they make are like foreign, secular, ungodly kings would have. Nothing like the mercy seat, and you better not be sitting on the mercy seat. 
because that's God's chair. Now, you are seated there, but in union with Christ in heavenly places. Amen? You are raised up, made to sit together in heavenly places in Christ. Well, where are you seated then? You're sitting on the mercy seat. You're sitting there in the Ark of the Covenant. Okay? I mean, these, and, and so this Isaiah thing, this is Isaiah seeing into the temple, and yet he was a prophet. He wasn't supposed to be in there. So I'm going to assume one of two things. He wasn't in there. He saw the real. Or he was in there like David might be in there, and no harm came to him because he was a true priest. Okay? So, so he's saying, I saw the Lord sitting upon a throne. Folks, that throne that he's talking about is the mercy seat, and he said, and his train filled the temple. So this is the temple. This is the equivalent of the tabernacle, only larger. And in there is the Holy of Holies. And then, then he said, and there stood, you know, cherubim on either side. That's the Ark of the Covenant. That's the mercy seat, amen? This isn't just some king temple with, with angels hanging out there. They don't hang out in king's temples. They hang out in the Lord's tabernacle, if you will. And then just notice again, I'll read verse 2. Above it stood the seraphim. Each one had six wings. With two he covered his face. With two he covered his feet. And with two he did fly. Okay. So you've noticed that before, right? With, he had six wings. Two he covered his face. Two he covered his feet. And with two he did fly. Okay. Because that's going to be significant later. All right. Now let's go to the book of Revelation chapter 4. Yes. Yes, please. Okay. Uh, let's try, that's Exodus 25, beginning with verse 17. Let's go ahead and go to Exodus 2. If you've already found Revelation, we'll be going there. <clears throat> okay, Exodus 25 and 17. And thou shalt make a mercy seat of pure gold, two cubits and a half shall be the length thereof, and a cubit and a half of the breadth thereof. And thou shalt make two cherubim of gold, of beaten work shalt thou make them in the two ends of the mercy seat. And make one cherub on the one end, and the other cherub on the other end. Even the mercy seat shall, be, shall you make the cherubim on the two ends thereof. And the cherubim shall stretch forth their wings on high, covering the mercy seat with their wings, and their faces shall look one to another toward the mercy seat, shall the face of the cherubim be. Okay, now let's go to the book of Revelation. Revelation chapter 4. <clears throat> All right, different translations are going to read this differently, but what you need to see is uh, the similarities. Verse 8, Revelation 4, 8. And the four living creatures had each of them six wings, does that sound familiar? Remember, Isaiah said six wings, two over his face, two over his feet, and with two he did fly. And this is using, you know, what is the, the King James beast or something like that? Uh, yes. So, and the four beasts, mine says the four living creatures, had each of them six wings about him, and they were full of eyes within, and they, they rest not day and night, saying, Holy, 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 Lord God Almighty, who was and is and is to come. Does that sound familiar to anybody? Um, uh, let's say in verse 9, and when those living creatures give glory and honor, and, and when those living creatures give glory and honor and thanks to him that is seated on the throne who liveth forever and ever. So again, this isn't some throne room like a royal king's room, throne room. This is the holy of holies. We've seen from Exodus, in the very beginning of the Bible, into the middle of Isaiah, all the way to the book of Revelation, a common thread. The throne is now not a throne of judgment anymore. It's a mercy seat. It's a throne of grace. Okay, Come boldly to what? Throne of grace. Well, it's not a king sitting there in the sense of what we think. It's the high priest sat down and finished the work and says, come and let me tell you, I'll, I'll tell you it's done. All right? <clears throat> so... Um, you've, you've got this common thread going on here that is similar to the high priest's uh, band on his, on his miter that said holiness to the Lord. These, uh, 
cherubim are crying holy, holy, holy to the Lord, okay? And now, I want you to think about something. I want you to think beyond the normal, you know, just pictures and stuff. Consider this. These are cherubim. They have never sinned, right? They've never sinned, all right? And they're crying, holy, holy, holy unto the Lord. And while they're doing it, and I mean, remember, there's the throne. He's sitting there. There's one of them on this side and one on this side, and they're, they're crying that to him. While they're doing it, they got their face covered, which represents who they are. They got their feet covered, which represents their walk and how well they're doing. And they've never sinned, and they're sitting in the presence of the Son of God himself and going, holy, holy, holy. Okay? Or is anybody getting the picture? They've never sinned, and yet they're covering themselves up and going, oh, my God, holy, holy, holy. Get it? All right. If angels that have never sinned, are crying holy, holy and covering themselves up, what do you think you would do in the presence of a holy God? Melt. There you go. That's, that's more like it. Just, just fade away. <clears throat> if sinlessness, come on, follow this. If sinlessness was holiness, they'd be saying holy, holy, holy to us. Wouldn't they? Wouldn't they? They'd be going, holy, 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 me and you, dude, we are holy, you know. And he is too, but I mean, we are too. I mean, Jesus never sinned. I mean, isn't that the big thing? Jesus never sinned. That's the big thing. No, it's not the big thing. The big thing is it's Jesus, the one. The one has finally come. The one that pleases the Father. The one that answers all things. The one that fulfills everything. And he fulfills it in your life if it's him or there is no fulfillment of all. So they've never sinned. So they could be shouting holy, holy to themselves. Without sin in their lives, they are covering themselves up and saying holy, holy to him. What a powerful thing. What is that telling us? It's telling us that holiness is way more than just not sinning. When you get to the point where you have not sinned, you're still going to be covering up and pointing to the Lord. Got it? And it should tell you this. Just pursuing sinlessness does not reach the ultimate of God. And the angels, the sinless angels knew it and covered themselves and said, we're not it. We are not it. Even though we didn't go with, you know, Satan and his fall and the ones that did, we are not it. Well, then who is it? Bam, right there, this one that sits on the mercy seat, the throne. He's it. He's the one. You, you get a similar picture in Revelation. Or, well, it's... Um, uh, what the same chapter or the, the chapter 5 here when John is caught up into heavenly places and he's up there and all of a sudden there's weeping going on in heaven I'll never forget when the Holy Spirit showed me this I'm seeing weeping going on in heaven and everybody's still searching going you know who is able to open the book Everything's not perfect in heaven. Everything is not wonderful in heaven. There's still needs. There's still light. Ah! Remember? And I'm going, well, you know, this is how your mind, I'm going, well, if, you know, if heaven hadn't got it, I mean, the whole point is I want to get to heaven so, we, you know, all this searching and frustration and everything is over with and this still looks bad to me even if I'm caught up up there. And then, then a messenger, thank God, an angel, a messenger, the word angel means messenger, a messenger comes and says, don't worry, 
that, yeah, there's nobody in heaven. You know, we say there's nobody in earth or under the earth. He said there's nobody in heaven, earth, or under the earth except one, and that was the Lamb of God. Not just Jesus. He's the only one worthy. And then everything changed, and everything went, Woo! We, now we've, we're, we're like the other two messengers on, the, on either side of Jesus, on, on either side of the mercy seat, on either side of the throne going, he's the one, he's the one. It wasn't about us being perfect anyway. It wasn't about us not messing up anyway. It was always about Jesus. Separation, holiness, separation under the one that is holy. Do you get it? You, you separate from yourself. You separate from everything else. Not that you don't sin or mess up anymore, but in your heart, you know we're not it. I'm not it. And you look over at that other angel that did perfect, and you say, and you ain't it either. Then who is? Don't start crying. It's Jesus. Any of you been crying over your condition? You know, walking around in heaven. You know, you're doing it on earth. You'll do it in heaven if you don't get this right. <laughs> you understand what I'm saying, you know. That, you, that if you don't have it figured out here, someone says, okay, there is no heaven. There is only heavenly places in Christ Jesus. Well, then consider this. You're walking around in Christ still whining because you think you're it and you're not measuring up. How sad is that? That's worse than walking around heaven. <laughs> That's walking around in Christ. Frustrated and whining and going, what? who can do this? What, idiot, the way you got in Christ, I'm sorry I'm using these terms, but I mean the way you got in Christ was to know that it was Jesus and all the, you have is you're joined to him and he's the one and you're supposed to stand there and go, holy, 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 and there's him himself, the Holy One of Israel. Glory to God. That's, that's actually considered good news. It's not bad news. That's some good news. Because you keep... See, what we're doing in a certain sense is... Now, we look at Jesus, and we try to measure up and bring ourselves to that stature. But we, it could be the same equivalent as looking at one of these angels and trying to measure up to him because he's sinless. It could be the same equivalent. And when John was walking around, remember? He was caught up there, and he's walking around. He bumps into an angel and falls down and starts to, you know, worship him. He goes, get up from there, dude. I am not it. When are you guys going to learn this? But you're, you're a perfect messenger. You always declare Christ and you're sinless. But I ain't Christ. I'm one with him, but I'm not him. Get up from there. Worship God. Worship the one who made you one with him. Quit being separate and trying to measure up to my sinlessness, if you understand. It's the same as Jesus' sinlessness. It's both sinless, so whether you do it with an angel or Jesus, you're on the wrong track. Oneness brings about holiness, and I'll, I'll explain that as we go. So if, if we stand before God, I mean... Again, picture just sort of based on the pictures of what we read, walking into a throne room and us standing before Jesus and going, oh my God, I'm a mess, I'm a mess, I'm so sinful and I'm so unworthy, right? Sinful and unworthy will just do you in, won't it? Sinful and unworthy. And you're sort of melting and shrinking down as you do that, and then you look up and you see these two angels on either side of them and you're going, man, they're really close to the Lord. Wow, they're getting to declare the message and everything. Wow, they've never sinned. They are, in a, you can say, they're not sinful. I mean, I'm sinful and unworthy. They're not sinful. You know what? As far as 
when it, when it comes to a standard of morality, they are worthy. But they have, as you're melting and you look at them, and this is kind of the way the picture happened with me, I lo I'm looking at them and I go, yeah, you can't see their faces or their feet either. They're all, they're all sort of ashamed, but not because of sin and not because of unworthy because they messed up. And I said in my heart, I need to change my approach to this whole thing. I have been wrong. I said, this is wrong of me. I'm coming on another basis altogether. And what you come to is you sort of chunk the sinfulness and unworthiness, stand back up, and you start going, holy, holy, holy is the Lord God. The high priest, holiness unto the Lord. And, of course, the high priest represents him who is the holiness of God. You say, well, you know, where, where do you get that? I think you get that in Hebrews, don't you? Let's flip over to Hebrews chapter 12. By the way, thank you, Mallory, for the many times you've helped me with scriptures. <clears throat> Hebrews 12. In verse uh, 14. <clears throat> Follow after peace with all men and holiness, without which no man shall see the Lord. Okay, so here we go. Here we go. Here's our carnal mind. <gasps> Follow after peace with all men and holiness, without which I won't ever see the Lord. My God, I'm not holy. Again, wrong definition of holiness. Holiness being sinlessness instead of separated under the Lord. And we'll give you the, the true definition of holiness separated under the Lord in just a minute. We start going through all this condemnation. Mainly, here's why we go through that condemnation. Because if there ever was a people that wanted to see the Lord, we want to see the Lord. And it says without it, we're not going to see the Lord. And so it strikes a chord in us that it may not strike in other people. And we go, oh my God, because I'm in sin, I'm not going to see the Lord. I'm so unworthy. Please stop that. <laughs> Please stop all that whining. And You know, if you, if you taste that drink, there's a lot of self-pity mixed into it. You know what I'm saying? There's a lot of, it's not, it's, you know, it's self-pity. Self-righteousness is self-righteousness. Self-pity is self. They're both off the same tree. Self-righteousness, self-pity, it's all self, you know. See, we think if we walk around going, I am the greatest Christian there ever was, oh, that's bad. But if we go, I'm so unworthy that we're, we're actually getting close to God. No, you're not. That's self-pity. It's not, first of all, you're, you're looking, you're like an angel looking at yourself, and instead of going holy, 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 you're going unworthy, unworthy, unworthy. <laughs> you know, where's the focus? It's not on the Lord, it's on you. It's on your condition apart from resurrection reality. And God only views you by resurrection reality. Only. Okay. He works in your little penny ante slave life down here to bring you to an awakening of oneness. He doesn't work to shape you up to, to finally gain the stature of an angel that never sinned because you'd still be unworthy. It's not based on, the, here's the deal, it's not so much that you're unworthy, it's there, that one seated there, that's the only one that's worthy. And that was another thing, they all cried out, worthy, worthy, worthy is the lamb. Who? Worthy is the lamb. Are you saying I'm unworthy? Well, are, are you the lamb? No, I'm not. Then you're not worthy. I'm not saying you're unworthy. I'm saying you're not worthy. Worthy is the lamb. Do, does anybody follow the way I'm saying this? 
the emphasis is not on what we are, but on what he is and what you are by oneness with him or, or don't even talk about you. Don't even consider you. God doesn't. <laughs> you know? He's not near as... Can you imagine Jesus sitting on the throne of grace? He's the high priest that sat down, finished the work, and he considers you his body and clothed with his beautiful garments. And you come into the throne room, and you go, Oh, Lord, I'm unworthy, and I messed up, and oh, God, I just, I just, I'm, I shouldn't even, I shouldn't even be in this... I've heard people say stuff like that. I shouldn't even be in this holy place. Talking about this Bible school. My God, the, the depth of delusion. <laughs> you know, everybody here has come to a revelation of Christ. Everyone's deeper than me. Every ounce of that is self-pity based on you judging yourself by an individual instead of judging yourself as, the, as dead and now risen as the body of Christ and now accepted in union with the beloved. Oh, you talk about, you know, does God love you? Yes, but he also loves the beloved and you are accepted because you are part of the, of, see, he, he could have said you are accepted in the one who did the right thing, which makes you sort of unworthy but lucky. But he said, you're accepted in the beloved, man. You, I, I love him, and you're part of him, and when I hug him, I hug you. Amen? Amen. And he does, because you've never hugged a person without their body. Not in reality, you know. In fact, you can't hug Jesus. You can only hug his body. He's enveloped in his body. You can't hug me. You can only hug my body. You know, the Lord made it that way. <clears throat> All right, so, so here in, you know, verse uh, <clears throat> 14, now follow after peace and follow after holiness. Okay, now you need to be following after holiness now because if you don't follow after holiness or, as we said, our definition, sinlessness, you're never going to see the Lord. Now, folks, there are people that preach that. All right, let's go to the next verse. Let's keep this all in context. Looking diligently, lest any man fail of the grace of God, lest any root of bitterness springing up trouble you, and by it many be defiled. Okay, first of all, the, the, the first thing to notice is that what you fail of here, you fail... He's not talking about failing the standard of God and then breaking laws and falling into sin. They've not f failed of the commandments. They've not failed the covenant by not keeping it. They have failed the grace of God that made them one and, the, and all that comes with the grace. You see, it doesn't say... F they have failed... From grace, they have fallen from grace. It says that in another place. You've left grace, and you're now trying to earn it by being better. Is that what it says? I mean, that's what mine says. <clears throat> and then look in verse 10. For they verily for a few days chasten us after their own pleasure, but he, speaking of God, he for our prophet that we might be partakers of his holiness. Oh, I think I'm getting it here. He doesn't want me to become holy. He wants me to become partakers of his holiness, and you can only partake of anything of the Lord's by being one with the Lord. Just like a branch partakes of everything of the vine by being one with it, and it flows into it by life. Okay? So, Long, uh, you know, a few verses above, before it said something about follow after holiness and all this kind of stuff, it had already laid the groundwork that it's not your holiness. It's his holiness, and that your goal is not to become holy, but to work on oneness so that you can partake of his holiness. 
Did anybody just catch that statement? Not to become holy, but to work on oneness. Period. Because he is holy, holy, holy. Now it's interesting because these angels, these angels who never sinned and never messed up are saying holy, holy, holy. But the thing that they're looking at is not just Jesus, but Jesus in his body. Amen? That's us. And going holy, 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 or separated unto the Lord. One, one more scripture on this, and that's over in, uh, where am I? First Peter. First Peter chapter 1. Uh, oh, I'm looking in Second Peter. That's that'll really mess you up. First Peter chapter one and verse uh, sixteen, <clears throat> uh, fifteen. But as he who hath called you is holy, so be ye holy in all manner of life. Okay, there it is. The dreaded view. If you don't see the Lord, you're going to see you. And if you see you, you're going to be in condemnation. Can I get an amen? amen? If you're seeing you, if you're reading the scriptures to see you and to learn things so that you can improve yourself, you're, you're wrong. You're on the wrong trail. But that's, that's the way we read these things. You know, as he hath called you as holy, so be ye holy in all manner of life. So, so it's clear, Randy. You're twisting the scripture. This is saying you need to be holy too because he's, he's that way. You need to be holy in all manner of life. But look at the next verse. Because it is written, be ye holy for I am holy. Folks, it didn't say do holy. It said be holy. Be is a, a state of being. It's not a state of doing. Be ye because he is. Be what he is. Be ye because I am. Okay? Isn't that a nice way of putting it? Be ye because I am. Well, he is the I am. He is the I am. He's not the I do either. He's the I am. You know, that's really part of the big problem in human earthly marriages. It's because we get up there and we say, I do. Instead of saying, I am. That's right. We say, I do, and we spend the rest of our life trying to do. You know? And we say, you know, in sickness and in health. Until they get really sick, and you go, you know, you're sick, and I'm sick of it. You know? If, but if you be, if it is your being... Then when you get in situations, you don't have to try to do something. You will do what you be. I know that's not good grammar, but it's perfect theology. You will do what you be. You will. You always will do what you be. Now, let me just, let me, let me clarify that a little bit, though. In crisis, you will for sure do what you be. Okay. In everyday life you you we're able to fake it and put on a happy face and look good okay did you know that we can do things when we're not under pressure and when everything's not bad but once the crisis comes it really shows who you are and i know this is a terrible example but the new batman movie well i won't but it's based on the Joker, who is a terrible mess, wanting to sort of prove that everybody is a mess, and he's got reason to. He's, he had a bad childhood just like I did, and bad, you know, bad father and stepfather and all this bad stuff. But he, he wants to prove by putting everybody in these different circumstances that once they're out of their normal way to act real good and you know everything's wonderful and aren't we all just 
Christians and love Jesus. But put them in a crisis, you'll find out what's in them. And, of course, Adam is in them, right? The old nature is in them. So they always end up showing who they are, which is a crushing blow to many people in, in the movie and in general to find out, you know, oh, my God, when you put me in this situation, now I have to face what I am, okay? <clears throat> so that's, that's enough said, and that doesn't take anything away from the movie. But, you know, we don't need the joker at work in our lives. We don't need the devil. We get in a crisis, folks. We will show what we are. Or can I say it like this? We will show what we be. Okay? All that does is say, I need to see Jesus. I need to see the oneness that I am because what I truly be is one with Jesus. And therefore, I do have the life of Jesus. And I can overcome these, but only by Christ. Okay? But the first step, the first step is never trying to get Christ so that you can do. Even if it's do the right thing. The first step is to learn oneness and let oneness take care of itself. I hope you're listening to me because it's a matter of emphasis. You're either a Jew, a, a, an Old Covenant Jew in your approach or you're a New Testament um, saint in your approach you're either seeking the Lord so that he'll improve your doing which is old covenant or you're seeking the Lord because you want the Lord and you love the Lord and you trust him for the results of oneness which is called what fruit fruit is not works Fruit is not works. Fruit is something you bear. It's not something you do. You bear it. You're only bearing his fruit. It's his fruit. It's the fruit of the life in the vine that is also the life that's in the branch that brings forth. There is no wood that brings forth apples and oranges. Do you understand? There's no wood, the, the, the branch I'm talking about. A wooden straw which is all a branch is, is a wooden straw. It doesn't produce fruit. The life at work and flowing through that branch start all of a sudden, life and fruit comes from it. Separate the branch from the life, not just from the vine, but the life of the vine. You understand where my emphasis is? It's never going to bring forth any fruit. So why do we learn oneness? Why do we, and when I say learn it, I don't mean academically. I mean with all of our heart that we think this way, that our minds have been renewed to oneness, that we don't have to uh, go through condemnation. We don't have to go through the, to the throne of, of grace and plead and beg and, and pray, oh, God, change me, I'm a mess. It should be, oh, God, conform me to the truth of your resurrection of what you did because you wanted us, because you wanted a bride, because you wanted a body, because you wanted a vehicle of your life. Bring my understanding more and more into what you've done by death, burial, and resurrection and make it manifest so that you have the joy of bringing forth what you want to in me. I admit I can't do this, and I don't even want to look in that direction. I admit, I'm not the holy one on the throne. Therefore, the head, and remember, all these garments are on the body except this one. The head bears the holiness, not the body. The body, and all of it is counted in that, because the head has it. And so we, 
and you remember the scripture where uh, I think it's in Colossians where Paul is dealing with the Colossians and the problems that they're coming up with and he's saying your problem is you're not holding the head you're you're trying to do something for God you're trying a, a form of religion of humility and of you know doing this remember he talks about the different things of humility and of aesthetic asceticism being um, you know mistreating yourself or depriving yourself of things folks deny yourself is not deny yourself of things it's deny self I deny you how do you deny self with a whack from the cross right whack I deny you <laughs> you're dead so you don't you don't leave self alive and say now I'm going to deprive you of of these things that you really want and like that would be asceticism that would be you know you, you know cor the correct word would be that would be asceticism the more clear word would be that would be torture <laughs> depriving self of everything self wants what a what a what a horrible religion Buddhist you know or whatever you know no you don't deny yourself of things you deny self and you can only truly deny self by the cross self you know see that's like trying to talk self into okay now now come on go with God on this good luck you know go with God be nice be nice you know I don't want to be nice you know just just calm down you know it's it's a little bit like trying to reason with demons you know best thing to do is cast them out you know now just look don't be so mean I'm gonna be what I am and I'm gonna be that way inside of them you know okay well if that's the way then come out in the name of Jesus you see what I'm saying well self is the same way I'm gonna be what I am and I'm gonna come out the way that I am you leave me alive I might stop for a while but I'm showing up I might put up with this because you have had uh, an inspirational moment with the Lord in this service but give me a week I'll, I'll I'll lay low for a couple of weeks but I'm gonna raise my ugly head again later on because I'm not dead right so what do you do you take the cross you give self a good good solid dose of the cross and you focus on the fact that you are now risen with Christ one with him and you come to a place where you believe it now probably everybody in this room and most of the people listening to this already believe this so this sounds futile you come to the place where you both believe it and you think this way from now on it's your mind if you understand what I mean it's the mind of Christ but it's now in you it's it's the way he thinks in you let the way he thinks be in you and all of a sudden now you don't you don't fall back into moments of of individualism and separateness you don't fall back into finding Christianity based on gatherings and 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 you know certain ritualistic things you find it all based on the fact that I'm one with Christ and I am not an individual and I come to you to be clothed with these garments of glory and beauty I come to you as your body not as me because these garments were not made for anybody but the high priest amen again right right teaching we must we must get to the place that this is the way we think and and 
This is the way we approach all of our situations in life. We don't get caught back up in the earth. We don't get caught back up with religion. We don't get caught back up with, with ourselves as an individual. We don't try to relate that Jesus, you know, that Jesus is going to fix me. He's not going to fix you. We were, as Robert was sharing in the last class, all of those stones went in, I mean, or, or, or one with him and is carried by him. All of those are carried as one. And he does nothing. See, we were raised up together. He didn't raise you up individually. You come to a revelation individually that you were raised up together. You see that? So that in his mind, oneness is everything. And oneness settles everything. And so there is genuinely a true leaving of your old identity, of your first birth, of the name and the person that you were based on that first birth. It's a dead man or woman as it may be, but it's a dead man because it all died as one together with Christ. He put us all away as one and then he raised us up as one with him. Praise God. Amen. Well, let's, let's stop. Getting anything out of these classes? I hope that you are. Father, we're just so desirous to get out of us and get into you. Oh, Lord, we don't want to be clothed upon as individuals. We want to put on these beautiful garments as the body of the high priest, meaning as the body of one with the one who sat down. And the one who sat down on that throne and that we're raised up together with is the high priest. And so, Father, make these things real in us. May we not vacillate between two opinions and two views. May we not vacillate between an old covenant view of ourself and a new covenant view. May we awaken, like you said, awake, awake, awake. I think you said it three times. Put on your beautiful garments. Awake to being the body. Awake to being one with the head. Awake to what is ours and to whom it is ours, the one that is joined to you. Father, we thank you for what the Holy Spirit is saying well beyond anything that I'm even saying in these classes, for I know he speaks well beyond these things. Thank you, Holy Spirit, for quickening your people and leading them ever onward into the reality that is settled. We ask you to do all of this and to make it real in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, it's my understanding that the birthday girl has a case.